Howdy. It's very late. I was going to work on some tracks, maybe film it, um, do another couple overdub sessions videos, and uh, I downloaded the tracks I was sent, dumped them into Pro Tools, and something's wrong. <laughs> They're not lining up to the grid. They are sharp. There's got to be something wrong in the conversion from what the producer sent me, so... I'm going to wait for him to check it out on his end. Uh, it just, I couldn't get it lined up on the grid, which means if I try to record to it, I'm going to be kind of chasing it. And then when he dumps it into his session, it's probably right on his end. And it was in the conversion before he sent it to me. The problem's in the conversion before he sent it to me. Um, so it'll pro it, it's just going to get really messy if I try to work on it now. So anyway, I, I started writing charts for tomorrow. I've got a couple of sessions and um, that's going to be fun. So I just recently switched up my speaker cab and my cartridge rig. I was using a 212 matchless, um, like an old 90s matchless. It's maroon, uh, real thin Tolex. Um, it's not super early. It doesn't have the suitcase handle, which I think the earliest ones did. Um, but it, it it's a 90s cab, and um, I put different speakers in it. Uh, <clears throat> and I really liked the way it sounded for a long time. Um, the speakers that I put in it were basically two of the same thing, even though they have different labels on them. One is a Heritage Greenback. Um, the ones that say 20 watts on the back. And I think they're actually still made in England. Um, most of the Celestian line is not made in England anymore. Uh, and then the other one is an EVH, which is supposed to be the exact same speaker with a different um, sticker on the back. It's, it's the Van Halen uh, red with the white and black stripes and says EVH on it, um, literally the same thing. It's a 20 watt greenback made in England. Um, it just has a different sticker and a different dust cap cover. So I've always been a greenback fan. Um, my favorite greenback sound ever was a matchless cab, early nineties, and it had the original matchless speakers in it. If you find an early enough matchless cab, it's a different speaker combination than what they do now. From at some point in the 90s forward, they've been putting a greenback on one side and a G12H30 on the other. If you go back far enough, it's a greenback and a vintage 30. I've always kind of hated vintage 30s, but the greenback in this early 90s matchless cab that I borrowed sounded unbelievable and it just had the perfect amount of growl and really pleasing high end and it was in an open back cab and I was like man this sounds awesome and I borrowed it because I was maybe going to buy this cab this guy let me check it out but <laughs> because I hate vintage 30s so much I didn't buy it I thought oh, I'll just find one that has I'll find one that's older that has a um, that has a G12 H30 in it, and I have never found that greenback sound since. <laughs> that was years ago. I still remember that cabinet. The guy was kind of like, "So you like it, but you don't want it?" I was like, "Yeah, I don't like I don't like vintage 30s, so you know, I'm gonna pass. I want to I want to be able to I want to be able to mic both speakers and get a usable sound that I really like out of both of them. I don't want to buy it just for one side of it. And the more I think about it, the more I wonder if there's something to the fact that there was a vintage 30 on the other side of that cab that made that greenback sound so cool. Even though I was listening to an SM57 close mic'd on the greenback, um Vintage 30s are quite a bit louder, and it's right beside it. Maybe it added something. I, I don't know. Anyway, um, that cabinet, 
the the red matchless cab that I ended up buying trying to chase that sound that I passed on uh it's just started to sound a little tired and part of what I love about greenbacks is the way they break up they're not a super clean speaker but they break up really nicely and my matchless cab with these two heritage greenbacks just seems you know, I'm listening to listening to it under a microscope. It's um, the majority of situations I've got a 57, like that close to the grill, and then there's a Royer right beside it. And I like to hear mostly the 57. I'm not a huge Royer fan. I don't love that sound. Um, most most engineers I work with will favor the 57 in, in my ears and, and in their control room. Um, but man, when whenever I ask them like, hey, could, could you just get rid of the Royer in my ears? And it's like, oh, there's my sound. There I am. I just don't, that excess low end for what I do, it just seems to get lost and get sort of uh, swallowed up in other parts of the, the mix. And then I feel like my guitar is not cutting through the mix. Like, I, I don't know. So, um, all that to say, I just carried my Bogner 212. I've got an oversized Bogner 212. Um, I just took that to Sony yesterday. <clears throat> Sorry, two days ago. I was there for two days. I took that there, pulled the matchless out, put the, the Bogner in and it's a completely different animal. It's a closed back cab. I've always been an open back guy. I feel like the sort of space and vibe and um, airiness of the sort of retro guitar sounds that are popular right now are so much easier to get with an open back. Like lots of spring reverb or something. You know, you can you can sound like a deluxe reverb or a tweed deluxe or, you know, an AC30, like they've all got that airy, it's not like everything's going, you know, smacking you right in the face because there's nowhere else to go out of the cab. You know, all of it's coming out of the front, out of the speakers. So it was a bit of an adjustment. Um, <clears throat> those cabs come with vintage 30s and the Bogners, right? I hate vintage 30s. <laughs> I, I feel like they sound great when you're just like, you have gobs of gain and you want definition. That's what I think they do well. And I never really play with loads of gain. My gainy sounds are fuzz sounds and they're thick and wooly, but they're not so gained out that you can't hear string clarity, you know? Um, so the cab's a lot cleaner sounding. I, I had to change everything on my amp, um, turn the low end way down. Um, and then I turn the top end down too. Uh, so I'm mostly what I play on sessions is my 64 baseman. I have a white knob, black Tolex baseman. They call that the tuxedo baseman. It's a transitional thing. It, it's, it's the same amp as the earlier, uh, 62, 63 white knob circuit, the blonde baseman circuit, um, it's a 6G6B, which is, I think, what Brian Setzer used. And that's what everybody thinks of when they think of that amp. But that amp is used on loads of huge records. Tom Petty, Beatles, one of my favorite um, records for guitar sounds um, from the Cardigans. Um, Long Gone Before Daylight or Before the Daylight Shot. Oh, man. I feel like there's an Ashley Cleveland record that's very similarly titled, and I'm getting the two of them mixed up. Um, that Cardigans record is ridiculous. I'll put the I'll put the title in the description because you have to check it out. The guitar sounds and the parts and the playing. It is a pop rock masterpiece. And um, there's a Telecaster tone on. <clears throat> The second song, I think, uh, that will blow your mind completely. Go listen to it and come back and comment on it. It's going to freak you out. That's a blonde basement into a 
Thain speaker, which is the uh, the speakers that came in high watt caps. So, um, I don't know. I, I was going to film tonight anyway. I was going to try to do some some videos for you all of, of these songs. And then there's some sort of tech issue with, with the tracks that he sent. So, I decided to talk about speaker cabs because they're so important. Um, you could have the most amazing sounding electric guitar that just sounds incredible unplugged. You can feel it resonate the whole time you're playing it. And you can be playing through an incredible amp. But <laughs> if it's coming out of a speaker that isn't doing you any favors, like you're, it's, you know, you might as well be playing a lot cheaper rig, I guess. Um, I've been through various phases in my career of speaker cabs that I get really attached to. This is the second time that I've that I've taken a Bogner cab out and, and put it in my cartridge rig. Um, I've had other matchless cabs. Uh, I've had a couple of Germino cabs. I like those because they're big. They're they're open back, but they're big enough, and the open part of the back is is narrow enough. It's not like the whole back is open. It's it's kind of a slot, you know that they they sound fuller like a closed back, but they've still got that airiness to them um, of an open back. I used one of those forever. That was my main road cab. Um, and then I used it when I moved to town and started doing sessions. Um, as far as speakers are concerned, I'm I'm still kind of a greenback guy. I I like the higher wattage, cleaner sounding greenbacks. Uh, one of my favorites is the Warehouse ET65, and I'm pretty sure they modeled that off after the '80s 65 watt greenbacks that Celestion put out. They're called uh, G1265s, and I call them greenbacks, but they're really they, they didn't, I don't think they had a green dust cover or a green cap or anything like that. I think they were just um, greenback style speakers with a 65 watt um, voice coil or cone or whatever. Whatever They put something in there that made it able to handle a lot more than 20, 25 watts, which is what traditional greenbacks are rated for. Uh, I had a couple of reissue Celestion G12Hs in that Germino cab. Um, my my cab that I use here at the house that I have mic'd up in the garage 90% of the time is a 112 Morgan cabinet um, with an ET65. But it's a different shape than most 112 Morgan cabinets. It's the same shape as a... Um, PR12 combo. It's the it's the cab that's taller, right? Taller and narrower. I've seen a, a lot of his 112 cabs that are a bit oversized for having 112. They're real wide. And this is like you took that cab and stood it on its end and then made it a little smaller. Um, but man, I love the way that thing sounds. That cabinet originally had my J012 amp that he and I cooked up in it and I just thought that for whatever reason the cabinet always sounded awesome so even though I took that amp out and made it a head so that I could put it in my rack for my session rig I still use that same cab um, same size and shape cab as as the JO12 combo um, with the ET65 in it so when I don't have cartridge for a session, I usually take my Lazy J. I have a J20 with the 6L6s. Uh, I bought it from Kenny Greenberg. Um, he is a huge Tweed Deluxe guy, and he's got a really old one that is like held together with duct tape. I'm not kidding. It is so ratty looking, but it sounds like gold. I mean, it is so awesome. And uh, he's been looking for something new to carry around that's got that sound. Because I think he keeps that in his cartridge rig as well. Kind of like we, we all keep our, our main, like our favorite things 
Like if you're going to pay somebody to come set up a huge rig that I don't have a box truck to carry myself, here's all the top stuff I can put in it. We, we all kind of do that. Um, his, his Tweed Deluxe is awesome. And while the Lazy J is fantastic, he's just so so stuck on his old Tweed Deluxe that he's kind of like, well, you know, it's really great, but I, I don't need it. I've got like five Tweed Deluxes. If you if you like it, you know, you, I'll make you a deal on it. And I cut it for a really great price, which is awesome. <laughs> but for me, it's like my favorite Tweed circuit. I love that amp. And it's got a speaker in it that I really had to get used to. It's uh, the Alnico Blue. Um... That term, Al Nico, some people say Al Nico. Uh, it's, it's the first part of the words of the types of metals that are in the magnet. It's aluminum, nickel, cobalt, I believe. That's, that's, what, that's what that kind of magnet's made out of. Uh, it's a 15-watt speaker. It's insanely loud. One of the most sensitive speakers ever. It's got like a 90... 101 dB sensitivity at one watt. Um, I think there are others that are louder, like an Eminence Wizard was made to be obnoxiously loud and clean. Um, but the Alnico Blue, for being so loud, it's a very dirty speaker. It has zero headroom whatsoever. It breaks up immediately. But that breakup is what you love about it. You know, paired with a, an AC30 circuit or a Tweed Deluxe, it's awesome. Um, my favorite recorded and live Tweed Deluxe sounds are Daniel Lanois. Um, I saw him play in town, and it was just one of the most amazing things I've ever heard. He had Brian Blade, um, Daryl Johnson, I think, L.A. guy, bass player. Um, and I think it was a trio, and they did a bunch of, like, electronica stuff. <laughs> he did the whole show, um, with analog synths, and he just would play this thing and plug things in and turn knobs, and Brian Blade was playing, and then, um, that was the entire show, and everybody at that show was waiting for him to put on a guitar and play guitar. You're in Nashville. It's freaking guitar town. Come on. And so <laughs> they walk off the stage, they come back out and, uh, he picks up his gold top and someone goes, F and finally, like <laughs> just scre <laughs> screams it. Um, but he, he picked it, he kind of laughed and he said, thanks for being so gracious. You know, the, this, this record was a just a creative exploration that that I really enjoyed, and and thanks for letting me share it with you. And then the whole encore, he played a really long set of, you know, all the stuff you want to hear at a Daniel Lanois show. And he had two Tweed Deluxes, um, and he uses an a super early version of the uh, Celestian Alnico Blue speakers, and they were called Silver Bells. A lot of people call them Bulldogs or Vox speakers. They came in the early AC30s, and they looked just like an Alnico Blue. Same same dust cover. Um, they would either have a Vox sticker or a, a sticker with a Bulldog on it. And he was such an AC30 guy that that was his main amp. But when he would play smaller rooms in theaters, he just felt like it overpowered the room. And so he would pardon me, he would take those speakers out and put them in Tweed Deluxes and run run two Tweed Deluxes instead in smaller rooms and theaters. And, man, there's just something about his hands, his old gold top, those amps with those speakers, and the, uh, the Korg delay. He's running a Korg rack delay um, into the front end of those amps. And he's doing everything from the volume and tone knobs, you know, and he, he doesn't use a pick. Uh, but man, the, the sounds and the tones are just so compelling and they sound so great. And I don't know, I, I think I try to get 
somewhere close to that with my Lazy J, you know. Here's my tweed circuit with my Alnico blue speaker, and I'm going to try to sound like Daniel Lanois, and I do not at all. Nobody does. He's also a killer pedal steel player. One of my favorites. Does everything, like, wrong <laughs> in the traditional sense of pedal steel playing, you know. Um, but, man, he's got such a vibe. He's just, that, that's all he is. He's, like, walking vibe, you know. Um, so when I don't have a session where somebody's paying for my big, um, my big amp rack, my giant vault of guitars, my cab, my pedal board, my guitar stand, um, I'll carry a couple guitars, smaller pedal board, and I'll take my Lazy J because it sounds amazing. And often, you know, I, I post some videos of me playing at studios where I sit in the room with the amp. Omni's like my favorite place for that because there's, there's a little amp cave right behind me uh, if I sit in, in this particular room and I can get feedback and really interact with the amp, kind of like you're able to live. Like we don't really get to do that a lot in Nashville because your, your cab's in a totally different room, isolated most of the time. But um, often on those videos, what I was getting at is that I don't, I don't use pedals nearly as much with that amp. I use them for solos and I'll use them to boost, uh, like just to hit the front end, but that amp goes from off to break up. <laughs> it doesn't have hardly any headroom. It's a Tweed Deluxe circuit, you know? It's not very clean at all. And I really like, depending on the project or what guitar I think I'm gonna be living on most days, I will run either the normal or the bright channel and I'll let the speaker and that circuit do the work of, of the breakup. And uh, I love single coil guitars through it, Tele, Gold Top, Jazzmaster, Strat. Um, I, I like humbucker guitars through it too, but there's a, there's a wooliness in the, in the low mids of a tweed amp that makes me feel like that Sometimes it makes me feel like I'm putting a little bit of slop in the track in terms of the EQ. But if I go in the control room and listen, it's like, okay, that sounds really classic and cool. It's just, I guess it's in my cans or something. I hear, I hear things differently in my cans than they hear in the control room. That's for sure. Um, for a long time, before I had the Lazy J, I was carrying a super clean 1965 Deluxe Reverb. And uh, that amp is in great shape. All original, minus the speaker. That's why I got it for a good deal back when I bought it. Um, I think I paid 1600 bucks for that amp a couple of years after I moved to town, like 2007 or eight. Like I got my first country gig and I'm like, oh, I need to have an old deluxe reverb. That, that's what you have to have. So I found that one. And uh, it came with a 70s Jensen in it that was just, you know, you turn the amp past two and it's going to have that like <laughs> in the breakup. <laughs> oh, gosh, I hate that sound. Um, so I went through a bunch of speakers and I landed on a warehouse ET65 in that amp. I still can take that amp to places, plug it in, strum one chord, and the engineer's like, I'm, I'm not going to touch anything. That's awesome. Um, I also went through a phase where I was carrying a Princeton reverb around. Um, let me think. I've had... I also went through a phase where I was carrying a Princeton reverb around, a 66. I bought that in 2009 outside of Boston, Massachusetts. I was playing a gig... And uh, I would check the Craigslist in different towns that I went just to see if there was anything for a good deal. I paid a thousand dollars for that amp, ten fifty. I paid ten fifty. He wanted twelve hundred, and I said I'd give him a grand, and he said ten fifty. And I was like, all right. <laughs> um, it was missing the original speaker. 
but it was untouched, like original two prong cord and everything. So I took it to Todd Sharp's place, Nashville Amp Repair, back when Jeff Heim was working there. Um, and uh, promptly did the phase inverter mod that Tom Bukovac was telling everybody, you have to do it, you have to do it. And it, it kind of makes the amp sit in between a regular Princeton and a Deluxe. Um, it's louder and cleaner. And I used to take that amp to gigs. I'd take that, a Tele, and a Fuzz pedal. And nothing else. Headstock tuner, you know. Um, I would use the reverb and the tremolo often and gratuitously to get really, you know, just kind of vibey sounds. I would I would work the volume knob like a volume pedal on my telly and uh, it was awesome. Like people really responded to that, especially other guitar players, you know. A lot of, a lot of younger cats in town would be bringing a matchless DC-30 or something and a pedal board the size of my desk and and they'd come up to me after I got done with my set and they're like what in the world was that <laughs> it's like man sometimes you got to get rid of all the crap you know and just play use use fuzz and reverb and the room use the room you know so <clears throat> I don't know I've, I've carried my share of giant pedal boards all over the place. I'm, I've been over that for a long time and I feel like we're kind of moving past it in Nashville. We don't, we don't have the, um, I don't want to say we don't have giant pedal boards. I want to say we're using the, um, gacky stuff a lot less frequently, which is cool. We're getting back to like honest guitar sounds, which is really cool. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm just curious what what are you guys using in your speaker cabs? What are you what are you using in your combo amps? What do you use live? Uh, what do you mic up when you record? And how do you listen when you play live? Do you stand in front of it with it blowing past your ankles? Um, do you have it tilted up towards you? Do you use a wedge where you have um, your speaker, your amp fed through the wedge. I used to hate doing that. I wanted my amp behind me, several feet behind me, um, not directly blowing at my ankles or, or the backs of my legs, but um, just on the floor. Sometimes I'd put it on a, uh, on a road case lid so it was higher, you know, but I always hated the sound of my amp coming through a wedge. Hated it. I just felt like it took all the vibe out because your wedge has this monster ultra clean speaker and then like a big horn. <laughs> and it was like, I don't want to hear that. I want to hear my amp. That doesn't sound right at all. So yeah, I'm just curious, curious what y'all are into, what speakers you've, uh, what you've gotten into. Um, that old Princeton, uh, I wish I could remember all the speakers I tried in it. I bought a 12 inch speaker baffle for it. Um, for a while there, everybody was putting 12s in their Princetons. And then for a while, everybody was running their Princetons into a 212 cab, like a basement cab or a Dr. Z or something. And that was actually a really cool sound. A lot of people did that. That was all Uncle Larry's doing. <laughs> um, I had I had a 10 inch red fang in it, a 12 inch red fang, a 10 inch Celestian gold. I had a 12 inch greenback, a uh, Chinese made greenback that I really liked. I had a warehouse Reaper 30, the early ones back when their, um, their speaker labels were way different. I still have that speaker. I might've sold it on Craigslist. I'm not sure. I had an ET65 in it. I had a, um, a Jensen Neo. 10-inch Jensen Neo. Uh, what else did I put in that amp? I've had a ton of speakers in that amp. And the one that beat them all is a 90s Mojo Tone labeled Eminence reissue. Uh, Eminence is a huge speaker manufacturer, right? And different companies would make 
or they would they would market they would hire eminence to make this make them a speaker and they then they'd market it as their like this is this is the mojo tone replacement for you know the 90s fender basement reissues where they had the 410 basements or a 410 blues deville you know um all those speakers were made by eminence but mojo tone was a company where you could go you could go to their website and buy parts, right? Um, late 90s, early 2000s, I remember buying, I think I bought amp handles from them and uh, speaker cabs. You could get empty speaker cabs. They sold all sorts of stuff. But they used to have this font. It was like a, a bubble font, right? It would, it would be mojo and tone, and the words looked really bubbly and... One of them's like pink and the other one's blue, like baby blues, very LA um, kind of kind of label. I found some ceramic 10 inch speaker that I, that I know is made by Eminence that had that Mojo Tone sticker on it. And that is the best sounding speaker in that amp of all time. It has everything I want. The speaker breakup is great um, when it does break up. It's also loud and clean. It's very balanced. Um, that size of cabinet with that circuit, I personally think a 12 is too much. A 12 is wrong. A 12 doesn't doesn't have room to breathe inside of inside of a Princeton Reverb cab. Now, a Tweed Deluxe cab is about the same size, and those came with a 12 inch speaker, but that's a wildly different circuit. So, um, yeah, that dumb little. 90s eminence and i remember i put a watch on ebay for another one it's like i have to have a backup i have to have a backup you know what happens if this goes down what am i going to use i don't know anything else that sounds like this and i found one i had like a i had alert an alert set up i want to say it was for almost two years and then finally mojo tone 10 inch ceramic speaker with the same label shows up on ebay i'm like yes it was like 10 bucks. Nobody wanted it. And I uh, got it. Sure enough, looks exactly the same. So I'm like, you know, I want to hear how it sounds. I want to see if it's as good as this one or do I have a fluke, you know. So I put it in the Princeton Reverb, fire up the soldering iron, you know, um, solder it in, turn it up, and it sounds the same. Turn it up a little more. Hey, it's still good. Turn it way up. I'm just plugged right straight into the front of the amp. And it's got Cone Cry. Ugh. So close. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever heard Cone Cry before, but it's a distortion in the upper mid-range that happens when you're pushing a speaker too hard. And it's a different note than what you're playing that starts screeching behind your note. And... Uh, you can hear it on a lot of classic recordings. Um, man, I'm trying to think of one off the top of my head. I used to have a whole list that I'd tell people like 15 years ago. But um, in my line of work where everything is under a microscope and I've got a, a microphone this far off the speaker grill, I just... Uh, I just couldn't do it, so I sold it. I think I got 20 bucks for it. <laughs> Paid 15, got 20. So I still have that that one eminence. And uh, I brought I brought that Princeton Reverb to a session a few weeks ago just because I hadn't played it in forever. And the acoustic guy on the session, my buddy Tim, um, who's a great electric player too and has loads of amps and stuff, um, he was like, oh, a 10 and a Princeton, huh? He's been a 12 in a Princeton guy for a long time. Well, toward the end of that session, he was like, man, that sounds really good. <laughs> it's like, well, you know, it's the right speaker. I know there's, there are 12s that sound that sound great. I just could never get it to not sound kind of boxy to me. I, I don't know. I still have the 12 baffle for, for my Princeton, but I haven't found any reason to pull this uh, this old, goofy... 10 inch mojo tone out of it so anyway i feel like i've rambled on long enough i'm tired 
I'm going to get up and finish writing charts and go do sessions. And then maybe some point this weekend, my buddy uh, will figure out what's wrong with those tracks he sent me. But I got a lot more stuff coming down the pipe, so um, stay tuned. And yeah, tell me, tell me what you're using these days, speaker-wise. I want to hear what you're using. And I want you to go listen to um, that Cardigans record and hear the glory that is an early 60s blonde basement circuit. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to start looking for, for something else. I, I really like the Bogner for now that I, that I have in my cartridge rig. And I did replace one of the... Um, Vintage 30s with a, a Warehouse Invader 50. Um, I've got a bunch of other Celestians I want to try in that too. I have um, I have a couple Alnicos. I've got those, uh, the G1265s. Um, I have the, the two different greenbacks in my matchless cab. Um, man, those Heritage greenbacks in a closed back cabinet are awesome. So, yeah, let me know what you're what you're using. Um, we'll see where where this takes us. See where I go with it. I'll, I might sometimes I buy a pile of speakers and then <laughs> I spend a long time swapping them in and out, you know. And uh, when I hear something, I'm like, "Ooh, this is really great." I bet after ten hours of playing, it's going to be sweet, you know. I'll I'll definitely do the deep dive. So anyway, thanks for hanging. See ya.